Listen, uh, those of you who are single, I wonder what it is that attracts you to somebody else. What's the list of qualities or characteristics that they need to have. I remember once a girl showed me her list and I don't even think Jesus would have met uh, the, the, the number of things that she wanted in a prospective husband. Or those of you who are married or, or are in long-term relationships, what was it that attracted you to your partner? Some of you are like, I have no idea. Um, or, or, or I've forgotten, I forgot long ago. Um, you know, I can't remember, I don't want to remember. Uh, some of you are like, uh, too much Chardonnay, um, but, uh, but that was a long time ago, obviously, before you were saved. Um, you know, psychologists and researchers study these things, and, and it's probably no surprise that men tend to be more initially attracted by appearance, by the physical, by the visible. Um, we, we, we are, are, are more uh, visibly, physical and or, visible orientated creatures, and then over time, we get to know the personality, and we discover if it's somebody that we want to get to know better. But mostly at the start, it is about how they look. But then and it's about how uh, we can talk to them. It's about how we connect. It's about how someone makes us feel to be around. And I know most of my friends would say this, my single male friends would say, that no matter how good looking somebody is, if they are um, as interesting as a stump of wood, they'll get bored quickly and look elsewhere. So uh, personality is very important. Women tend to be a little bit different. They look at the overall package. Women uh, tend to... Uh, think, well, maybe he's not conventionally great looking, but he compensates in other areas, you know, and, and that uh, makes him more attractive. I've heard, uh, that was a loud cough from my left there, by the way, um, you know, I've heard girls say that, and, and you'll rarely hear a guy say this, but I've heard girls say at the start I didn't really fancy him, but then I got to know him. Um, or there was just something about him, or he wasn't my normal type, but there was something that stood out about him. Other traits that women tell us they find attractive are sense of humor, don't take yourself too seriously, man, confidence, but not arrogance, independence, self-respect, men who make them feel special, and a man who takes care of himself. He doesn't have to look like Brad Pitt, but he doesn't have to look like Wurzel Gummidge or a Trump. Either uh, basic hygiene is important, no girl wants to cuddle up with a man who smells like a skip and so uh, a little bit of Lynx Africa and you are good to go. Today we're looking at Ruth chapter 2 and we're going to see the beginnings of romance. We're going to see what attracts this couple to each other initially. I did tell you last week that the book of Ruth is one of the greatest love stories of all time but if you were here last week it seemed more like a Shakespearean tragedy than a love story. We have this guy called Elimelech. He's married to Naomi and they have two sons called Malon and Kilion. Malon means sickly, Kilion means death, not the best prophetic names to give to your kids. And there's a famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. There's a famine, and so their hunger drives them to go somewhere that they were never meant to be. And that is to a place called Moab. Moab was a godless place. Moab was somewhere that... Um, that had pagan gods that didn't worship the God of Israel and they were Israel's enemies and yet they went there because of hunger. When you step out of the will of God, when you step out of the protection of God, things don't go well. And uh, first of all, Elimelech dies and then the two sons die, which was no big surprise when you call them sickly and death. Uh, but uh, So we now have uh, left is, is Naomi who was Elimelech's wife, and her two daughters-in-law, her two Moabite daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. After about 10 years ago, uh, Naomi decides she's going to go back home. There's, she's heard that there's now food back home. And so she starts off back home, but about halfway there, she stops. And she says to the two girls, girls, why are you coming with me? You're foreigners. You'll not be treated well. There's nothing for you there. You're not going to find a husband. Even if I had more kids now, you're going to wait 20 years till they grow up to marry them. Girls, go back to your own land. And Orpah is already gone. She's on the first bus back to Moab. But Ruth says, no, I am going to stay with you. And we have this, these beautiful words, wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be mine. God uh, and nothing's going to separate us unto death and so we have that beautiful scene but it's also very sad at the end they're back in Bethlehem they're broke they're hungry they're helpless and their life is going to be spent begging and looking for charity 
Naomi's not in good form at this stage. She gets back to Bethlehem and they call her Naomi, which means pleasant. And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because uh, Mara means bitter. And the Lord has made my life very bitter. So that's where we finished chapter one. It was like a double episode of East Enders. Um, it was just that much fun. But we're now into chapter two and we're literally just going to work our way verse by verse through chapter two for the next 30 minutes. And it is 30 minutes, judging by the first service, unless you get a few freebies. Um, now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. Boaz. That's a solid name right there, isn't it? It's a good name for your son. Better than Malon and Kilion. Boaz means strength. Bow. You know, bow. There's bow. I bet you he had cowboy boots and a Stetson hat and, and a really thick, bushy moustache that it took him about a day to grow. You know, when he's just a... You can imagine him just being this, this, this strong guy called bow. And we were told a number of things about bow here. The first one is this, that he's related to Naomi through marriage. He's probably a cousin of her husband, okay? So he's related to Naomi. And the second thing is this, he's a man of standing. He's a man of position. He's got a bit of money. He's well known in the community of having good character. People look up to him. People respect him. He's a businessman. He's a good, solid bloke. Plus, as we find out later, he's also single. So he's single, rich, and godly. If he came in here, he wouldn't stand a chance. Um, <laughs> I read this, and I'm going to read it, okay, uh, and uh, it may thin out the church next week, but that's okay. We could do with a few seats at the back, couldn't we? Um, it's, uh, uh, this is off Pinterest. It says, to all the girls who are in a hurry to have a boyfriend or get married, a piece of biblical advice. Ruth patiently waited for her mate Boaz. While you are waiting for your Boaz, don't settle for any of his relatives. Brokaz, Puraz, Lionaz, Cheatinaz, Dumaz, Drunkaz, Cheapaz, Locked Upaz, Good for nothing as, lazy as, and especially his third cousin beating your ass. Um, we, yes, I'm sorry about that. Becky made me read that. Um, wait on your Boaz and make sure he respects you. Uh, good advice. But Boaz is a good man. He's a godly man. He's a single man. But there's one more thing I learned this week about Boaz that I hadn't understood before. Do you know who Boaz's mum was? Rahab. Remember Rahab in Joshua 2? When Joshua sends the spies in to check out Canaan and they need somewhere to hide and they come to the house of a prostitute called Rahab and it wouldn't have been unusual for strange men to be at her door day and night and so they think they can hide there. And while they're there, Rahab actually says this to them. She says, I know that God has given our land into your hands. And so I would ask you for one thing. Would you come and occupy our land? Will you be faithful to my family? Will you spare us? Will you protect us? And they obviously kept their word. Because here's what we read in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Isn't that beautiful? That we have this woman of disrepute. This woman who was looked down on by the culture. This woman who had been... Uh, abused by men and misused by men and yet she she marries this guy Salmon and they have a son called Boaz and he's a godly man he's a good man he's a man of standing he's a man of character and he loves God I just I love how God takes the people who the world would put to one side who the world would reject and he uses them and that's actually the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 that actually Rahab the prostitute became part of the lineage of our Lord Jesus. Anyway, verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth opens the cupboards and the fridges, and there's no food in the house. There's nothing. There's no welfare system. There's no dole. There's no food banks. And so unless they get food, they're going to starve. But there was this thing called gleaning under Levitical law. And gleaning basically meant this, that if you were plowing a, or if you were harvesting a field, a barley field or a wheat field, and some fell on the ground, you just left it there for the poorest 
in society to come along. Or if you were harvesting a field and there was a little bit left at the edge that you weren't able to get to, you didn't go round a second time, you left it there. And this was a provision that the Lord made, that the poorest in society, if they were hungry, could go and they could pick up the, the scraps, they could pick up the little bits of grain and they would be fed. And so Naomi, uh, Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going gleaning. It's like saying I'm going to the local restaurants and I'm going to hang out at the end of the night and see what to throw out. I'm going down to the local Tesco and whatever they put in the bins at the end of the day that's just out of date, I'm going to bring that home. That's kind of the equivalent of what's going on here. And I love this because she simply uses what she has. Ruth doesn't have much going for her. She's an outsider and Moabites weren't exactly popular in Israel. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have any money, but she uses what she has. And when you use what you have, God takes a little and makes it a lot. Her options were limited, but it's amazing what can happen when you're willing to work with what you have. I was reading about a lady called Joanne. Joanne had her first child at 28. She had studied abroad, while she was there, she'd met a guy in Portugal. she got married to him. And then she, they had a, a, chi <clears throat> a child together. But just less than five months after their, they had a child together, her husband left her. And she's left alone now in Portugal with this little newborn baby, this five-month-old baby, trying to figure out how she's going to survive. Joanne moves back to Edinburgh, to her hometown. And she doesn't know what to do. She said, basically, she said this. If there was one step above homelessness, that was me. She's living on welfare. But one thing that she had always been able to do was write. She loved writing short stories. She loved uh, crafting just uh, characters and, uh, and little, little booklets. And, and people told her she was a good writer. So that's what she would do. She would go into the coffee shops in Edinburgh with the pram beside her, her little baby sleeping in the pram beside her. And she would start to write stories. And then these stories became a book. And she took the first book and she brought it to, let me see, how many publishers? Twelve publishers. And they all rejected her until one said yes. Joanne is probably better known to you as J.K. Rowling, the mastermind behind Harry Potter. She's richer than the Queen of England, but her success was rooted in the seeds of her struggle. It didn't come easily or all at once. Most overnight successes happen over 20 years. But she just kept do, writing and doing what she knew to do. That's a beautiful picture of what Ruth's doing here. She's just doing what she knows how to do. She's doing the best she can with what she has. Look at verse 3. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So <clears throat> Ruth goes out, and basically the harvesters are, are, are doing their harvesting, and she is behind them on her hands and knees, picking up the little bits of grain and a little bit of wheat and barley that, that they leave behind. But it says, as it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz from the clan of Elimelech. I love that little phrase, as it turned out. It's just so casually thrown in there. It just so happened, other translations say, it just so happened that she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. It just so happened that Ruth ends up in any old field. No, it wasn't any old field. And it wasn't any random field. She finds herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, a man who was related to her dead father-in-law. It just so happened. It makes it all sound like coincidence, you know, the chance, good luck, happenstance. The writer, I think, is being ironic when he says, as it turned out, it just so happened. <coughs> there were thousands of acres, hundreds of fields. When she went out the door that day, she could have turned left or right. There were no supernatural signs, no angelic visitations. But the Bible says that the Lord directs the steps of the righteous. And she walked down the road, and I don't know if she walked past other fields, but there was one field that just looked right, it just felt right. And she went in there. And that's where she ended up. And I want to say to you, it wasn't luck, it wasn't chance, it wasn't happenstance, it wasn't circumstance, or it wasn't coincidence. It was divine providence. It was the hand of God on her life, but she didn't know it. She's at her lowest place. She's hungry. She's husbandless. 
She doesn't know where to turn, and yet the fingerprints of God are all over her life. Verse 4. Just then Boaz arrived. I mean, what's the chances? From Bethlehem. And greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. And they were Church of Ireland. And they said, and also with you. I love that. Just then, it just so happened, Boaz pulls up on his Lexus camel. And he gets off it. And he greets his workers. The Lord be with you. He's a man who's open about his faith in God. He's a man of God. He brings his faith into the workplace. Imagine you go to work tomorrow and you know when you walk in and your boss says, praise the Lord, and you'll go, praise his holy name. That's unlikely to happen uh, where you work. But that's what happens here. He's a man who is full of faith. His faith is central to everything he does. Verse 5, Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? So Boaz gets off his uh, high-speed camel and He's looking around at all the harvesters and there's a lot of girls there doing work, but there's one that stands out. We don't know why she stood out. Maybe she was particularly beautiful. Maybe he knew the other ones and she was unfamiliar. Maybe she was dressed differently because remember, she's from another country. And sometimes you'll be driving through town and you'll be able to see people and go, they're probably not from Portadown because they dress differently. We don't know that, but there was something about her that stood out. Maybe it was that she was just stunning. Maybe she was beautiful, but there was something that stood out. And he says, who's she? Who's she? Who is that? It's almost like it was love at first sight. There was something about her. You know, most of you will know that when Becky and I met 11 years ago, it was one year then after that we were married. We got engaged after four months and married nine months after that. But what had happened before we actually had our first date was I had seen her two or three years before that. I had been at Summer Madness a couple of times doing different things. And I kept seeing this girl with curly blonde hair. And I kept thinking, who is she? And she was helping in a cafe, or I'd see her walking along. And I kept thinking, who is that girl with the curly blonde hair? I've got to find out who she is so I can stalk her. I mean, go and worship Jesus in her youth fellowship. Uh, and, but, but it was a few years before I actually uh, got to know her. And a similar thing happens here. Boaz uh, sees Ruth, but he doesn't know her yet. And he says, who is she? Who is she? I've got to get to know her. Look at what he's told, verses 6 and 7. The foreman replied, She is the Moabites who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily. She's a hard-working, resourceful, resilient woman. She worked in, as a field and has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Notice what the foreman says. She's the Moabites. That's her first identity. She's a foreigner. She's that one from overseas. But she did come back from Moab with Naomi. She's got a reputation. People know about her. People have heard about her. She thinks she's completely anonymous. People are talking about her. I'm sure there's maybe some gossip about her that's negative. But there's also a good reputation that she came back with Naomi. She didn't have to. She left her family. She left her foreign gods. She left her false gods behind. And she came back to care for her mother-in-law, even though there's nothing for her. Her reputation goes before her. And I want to tell you, your reputation goes before you. Sometimes you will find doors opening for you and you'll not have any idea how the person heard about you. But they'll have heard from a friend of a friend of a friend. They'll have watched your character over time without you recognizing it or, or realizing it. People pay more attention than you think. I remember when I worked for Unilever before I went into ministry. I went into the, I told my boss I was leaving to go into to train for ordination. And I remember I had never really had a big, you know, they knew I was a Christian, but I had never made a big fuss about my faith in the workplace. And, uh, and I went in and told the girls in the office and, uh, that I was going into the ministry. And I remember they said, we're not surprised because we've never heard you use a swear word while you've been working here. Now, I'm not saying I never used a swear word. They just hadn't heard it. Okay, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure there was a, the occasional slip up in the time I was there. But they, they noticed. People notice these things. You don't realize who's watching you. You don't know who is noticing. And, 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 and Ruth has been noticed. Look at verses 8 and 9. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you're thirsty, go get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. 
So Boaz goes over to Ruth, and here's his chat up line. It's not, do you come here often? It's not, you know, was your dad a thief? Did he steal the stars out of the sky for your eyes? It's not, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going here. It's not, are you Jamaican? Because Jamaican me crazy. Uh, it's not, feel this shirt. What's that? Boyfriend material? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. Okay, one more. Are you a parking ticket? Because you've got fine written all over you. Okay, he didn't use any of those and don't use any of them. Okay, definitely don't say your pastor told you to use them. Uh, Ruth, look at, look, look at Boaz's first line. Ruth, my daughter. Ruth, my daughter. It seems like Boaz is a bit older than Ruth. Most scholars would say Ruth was probably mid to late 20s. And Boaz was probably mid to late 30s, maybe even early 40s. And he calls her my daughter. It's a term of fatherly affection, of warmth, of protection, of care. Look at what he tells her. He says, don't go into anybody else's field. Why? Well, think about it. She's a single girl who's attractive. She's foreign. She's poor. And she's vulnerable. And people like that tend to attract the wrong sort of men. People like that tend to be taken advantage of. And so he says to her, well, you're in my field, you're under my protection. And I've told the other guys not to lay a hand on you. And if they do, it's a big field and they'll never find the body. So you stay here. And as long as you're within my boundaries and borders, you'll be safe. And I love that. I love that his first instinct isn't to try and sleaze with her, isn't to try and get it on, isn't to try and, you know, get a date or to... His first instinct is to protect this young woman. How we need godly men, how we need Christian men, whose first instinct is not to manipulate or to exploit or to abuse women, but to protect them, to protect their dignity, to protect their reputation. In a world that people talk about toxic masculinity, can I say, I hate that term. Men aren't toxic, just some people are toxic. Girls, you've met some toxic women in your time. And there are toxic men and there are toxic women out there. But God's men should be different. When the guys in work are making a sleazy joke about some girl who walked past, you shouldn't be part of that joke. In fact, you should shut that thing down immediately. Fathers, I know your first instinct is to protect your daughter. When that guy at 14 wants to take her out on a date, borrow a gun. <laughs> doesn't even have to be real. It just needs to look real. Let him know what's going to happen if he messes with her. We live in a culture where I, I just, it just terrifies me. Where we, 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 see, we see young girls. I mean, we've seen all of that in England with the exploitation of young girls. I want to ask, where were, where were the parents? When these 13-year-old girls were hanging around takeaways drinking, where were the parents? Christians, men, women, Let's look after our kids. Let's look after the vulnerable in society, not just our own kids. Let's look after other people. But particularly, I, I just I, my, I have a real heart for, uh, in this area for vulnerable women, for women who just yesterday I had a conversation with a, a, a young woman who literally has had to, she's, she's, she's been beaten up by her husband a number of times. And I just, my heart broke when I came off the phone. Um, men, Christian men, we need to set the standard. We need to set the standard in how we protect. We need to set the standard in terms of purity. We need to set the standard in terms of morality. We need to set the standard that when everybody else is going that way, we're people of integrity and character. And that's the sort of guy that Boaz was. And girls, young girls, single girls, just because he's got a six pack and looks good on Instagram doesn't mean he's the right one. If he hasn't got godly character, keep on walking, son. Girls, you want a guy who's not going to mess you about. You want a guy you can trust. You want a guy who you're not wondering on a Saturday night who else he's with. Christian girls, Christian guys, both love God, both going in the same direction. That's the ideal. I know that's not the case for everyone, and I know, but that's the ideal. Guys, girls love Jesus going in the same direction. It just makes life a lot easier. Boaz is that sort of guy. 
I remember there was a guy in Dublin came into our church. He was a record producer and one of the worship leaders. He, he started saying he could get her a record deal and they met up for coffee and then he wanted more and she didn't. And then he started sending suggestive text, text messages to him and then she didn't reply and then he started sending very abusive and explicit texts and, and we didn't see him for a while and then I remember she was about to lead worship one Sunday just at, as a service and she got on the stage and I, saw, I was at the back and I looked up and I saw her face and the guy had just walked in and he went and sat down somewhere sort of two thirds back on the left hand side and I just just as she was about to lead worship I just tapped him on the shoulder and said come on out and he was all smiles and I brought him out the back door and uh, he never came back to our church again let's just say um, we will not tolerate anyone who abuses the vulnerable who abuses uh, who, who is here to sleaze who is here to, to um, we just don't do it we're the men and women in this church want this to be a safe space for everybody. Adults, children, the vulnerable, the weak, anybody. This is a safe space and we're going to make sure it stays that way. Anyway, you can tell us something I'm passionate about. Look at how Ruth responds. Verse 10, at this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Notice her identity. She just sees herself as a foreigner. She's carrying this label of shame around. She knows that she's a Moabitess. She can't see beyond her identity, but he can. We need people who can see beyond our shame. We, get, we need people who can see beyond the things that we regret. He sees something beautiful in her. And she bows down to him. And let's be honest, all us men would love that. She falls at his feet. She's my hero. I mean, we, we, we love that stuff. And she asks, why are you being so kind to me? Now, remember, it might have been her looks, her appearance that initially attracted but that's not enough because look at what he says to her verses 11 and 12 Boaz replied I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before may the Lord repay he just keeps bringing the Lord into it may the Lord repay you for what you have done may you be richly rewarded by the Lord the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge it's her character that stands out. That's what he's heard about. It's her kindness. It's her compassion. It's her caring nature. Not only is she beautiful on the outside, she's beautiful on the inside. And can I again just talk? I know the youth are in here today. These things are, are great and these things are awful. Because you go onto Instagram and you compare yourself to other people. And you're looking at these girls who are wearing... Well, they call it a skirt, but it's a belt. And they're, 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 they're flaunting. And, and there's this pressure to conform. There's this pre And they look like a bunch of clones in the end of them. Can I say, guys might go with girls like that for one night, but that's not the girls that guys want to spend the rest of their life with. Guys want girls with character. Guys want girls with dignity, self-respect, who love God. And so don't get caught up into that whole bubble of I've got to look like this. or, or what, just, just do your thing and love God and put him first and allow the Lord to direct your steps. There's nothing wrong with looking your best. There's nothing wrong with doing the best you can with what you've got. But you've got to have more than that. If there's not a bit of substance and character there, you get bored very quickly. Let's be boys, girls, youth, Men, women, who are known for our character. That's what attracts Boaz to Ruth, and eventually Ruth to Boaz. Character and kindness. Ruth's reply, verse 13. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and spoken kindly to your servant, though I don't even have the standing of one of your servant girls. You're, she says, I'm a nobody. Those servant girls, I'm, I'm, I'm below the social scale on them. I'm the lowest of the low, and yet you have shown me so much kindness. You've shown me such attention. Verse 14, he just can't stay away. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread. Dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. This is her first date. It's dinner. It's not the cinema, it's not a DVD at home, it's not Netflix and chill, it's dinner. Somewhere they can talk and get to know one another. 
And he gives her so much to eat that she's some left over. That's a good meal, girls, okay? In fact, she's got a doggy bag to bring home to Naomi. As she got up to glean, Boaz gives orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Again, do you see just that godly protection? Don't embarrass her. Rather, here's what I want you to do. Pull up some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. In other words, take the hard work away. She was the one who was having to pull up the stalks. Why don't you just accidentally on purpose drop some? Make it easy for her. You know? Instead of her having to go through the bins at the back of the restaurant, why don't you just set out a few boxes of food? Is kind of what he's saying. Make it easy for her. And he says, look after her. Don't embarrass her. He's a good man. Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to an epha. She's a hard-working girl. She's hoping to pick up a few scraps, but at the end of the day, she's gathered an epha. And I know that you all know what an epha is, so I don't need to tell. No, you know, it's about 20 to 25 kilos. Like, that's a big shop, you know. She probably needed two Tesco trolleys she'd the neck to get home with them. Like, like, that's a big bag of food. 25 kilos, that's a fortnight's food right there. Verses 18 and 19. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she'd gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she'd left over after she'd eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is dun 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 Boaz, she said. You can imagine, it's getting on in the day and Naomi's looking out the window going, where is Ruth? I hope she's safe because it seems like it may not have been all that safe for people like Ruth. I hope she's home soon. And then she sees her coming up the street with these two shopping trolleys full of food. And she's like, what, what the flip is going on here? Where did you get all that? Hope you got club card points for that. That's a lot of food. And Ruth says, wait till you hear. Wait till you hear. So, so, so I leave here this morning. Remember? Yeah, yeah, remember. And I go down the road, yeah. And I turned left, yeah. And then I saw this field and I thought, I'll try that one. And you'll never guess, that was the one I went to. And, 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 I, and I just happened to find this field. And, and, and I was there and I was gleaning and I was picking up scraps. And then the guy pulled up in his, his, uh, his, his fancy camel and he got off. And, and, and his name was Boaz. And she's like, what? His name was Boaz. Let me finish the story. And Naomi's like, did you just say Boaz? And Ruth's like, I just said Boaz. And she's like, but don't you know he's one of our kinsman redeemers? And again, I know that you all know what a kinsman redeemer is, but for the two of you who don't, let me just explain it to you right now. A kinsman redeemer was this, that if your, basically land was everything in those days, okay? To survive, you owned land. You lived on land, you grew your crops on land. So everything was based on land. That's why when they go into the promised land, they're very careful about how they divide it up among the clans, okay? Land was everything. But land was passed through the male line. So you needed sons. Naomi, her two sons are dead. Ruth has no sons. There's no male line to pass it through, which means there's no land. Unless... There's somebody else in, your, in the husband's line who can step in and marry the widow and any children they have, the land comes back in. He is a kinsman. Kinsman means relative. And he's a redeemer. He takes back what was his that was lost. Kinsman, redeemer. And Naomi can't believe it. She says, Bo is one of your kinsman redeemers. But Ruth, this is unbelievable. And Ruth's like, no way. And she's like, way. <laughs> the family inheritance can come back. And Naomi's starting to plan, just like any good Jewish mother would when she's got a daughter-in-law who's single. She starts to plan. She starts to scheme. She starts to strategize. But you're going to have to wait the next week to see what happens. <laughs> But remember last week at the end I said, don't judge your life by one chapter. Don't judge your life by a bad chapter. Because we all have bad chapters, but that's not the whole book. 
And at the end of chapter one, it looked like nothing was ever going to be good again. But things are starting to look up now. Not only have we turned a page, we've turned a corner. And do you see something happening with Naomi where she's starting to soften? She's starting to become a little bit less bitter. She's starting to talk about the Lord again. She's starting to see that the Lord hasn't forgotten about her in the midst of her adversity. But I want to go back to that little phrase where we started. It just so happened, or as it turned out. And I want you to look over your own life and think about those moments, those just so happened moments, those moments when you had a conversation that wasn't planned, nothing dramatic, you were just going about your routine, the mundaneness of your day. Maybe you had a phone call. Maybe you responded to a text message. Maybe you just, something happened and in that moment, something turned and your life was never the same again. And it seemed like chance and it seemed like luck or it seemed like happenstance. Can I say to you, it was God's divine providence. That even in the darkest places of your life, even in the times when it feels like God has abandoned you, even in your lowest places, God never leaves you. His fingerprints are all over your life and he is incredibly intentional and strategically specific in his dealings with you. He, let me repeat that. He is incredibly intentional and strategically specific in his dealings with you. He knows what he's doing in your life. It might not feel like it right now. It might not look like it. But I want to tell you that the Lord has his hand in your life and he is working all things for your good and for his glory. One of the saddest funerals that I ever had to do was for a little boy called Hugh Stack. Hugh was born actually around this time of the year, a number of years ago. And from he was born, he had some congenital disease. They couldn't figure out really what it was, but they knew that he wouldn't survive. And for uh, eight months, Hugh was in hospital. His parents were part of our church. And then eight months later, little Hugh at eight months old, died. And anyone who's been to a little baby's funeral just knows how horrendous that is when you see the little coffin at the front. But I, I conducted that funeral that day. And, uh, and it seemed like the darkest, most tragic moment. And yet in the midst of it, Hugh's parents, Adie and Marty, were beginning to sense the Lord stirring something. In their own grief, in their own heartache, they began to sense the Lord impress something on their heart. Because they noticed something. When their little boy, Hugh, was in the hospital for those eight months, they were able to take it in turns and go home. They lived in Malahide, just up the road, and they were able to take it in turns to go home, and one of them would stay. They noticed that there were parents from Cork and Galway and different places around the country who didn't have that luxury, because there was only one really good children's hospital in the south. And so those, children, those parents would be sleeping on the floor sometimes for months. They'd be sleeping on plastic chairs, wherever they could find somewhere. For months, these parents who didn't want to leave their little one's side would sleep anywhere just to be close to their little ones. And so after Hugh died, Adie, who's a businesswoman, she owns probably around 20 pharmacies, she cashed in her pension. And she looked for a building in Dublin One. And she wanted one that had four corners that faced all four directions to say this was for North, South, East and West Ireland. And she cashed in her pension and she bought a big house just up the road from the hospital. And she put, um, how many rooms are in it? 14 rooms in it, actually. I think they've added an extension to it now. But it's basically 14 hotel rooms in it for parents and families who have little ones in hospital that they can stay completely free and get fed by volunteers, all the food is free, all the accommodation is free. There's people there that's uh, on hand to care for them. And every room, if you put up a photo of one of the rooms there, that's one at the top, and that's the park out the back. Every room is decorated by a family who lost someone before, and, and it's the sort of room that they would have wanted to stay in. And Adie there, and that's Marty, Adie was named RTE Person of the Year a few years ago and has had the opportunity to share her faith in Christ and how God carried her through that most tragic circumstance, nationally and internationally. 
And I guess my point is simply this, in the most tragic of moments, God is still present. In the most tragic and horrific and horrible moments of our lives, God hasn't left us. And not everything that happens is good. You see, Romans 8, 28 says this, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Notice what it doesn't say that all things are good, and it doesn't say that he makes bad things better. But in the midst of all things, he is at work. He didn't cause them, but he works through them. And I want to say to you right now as I finish these moments, that whatever you're going through right now, or whatever you will go through, or whatever you have gone through, God is in the middle of it with you. And he's working in the middle of it. And he's intentionally, he's incredibly intentional and specifically strategic in his dealings with you. And he will work all things, not some things, all things, for your good and his glory if you will invite him in to those places and spaces of your lives where it feels like you're empty.